everyone. Finally, we're back. All right, everybody. So this has been a wonderfully amazing and awful experience all at the same time. <laughs> Colby and I have legitimately been trying to broadcast this episode of the podcast out to you for the last three days. Three days. Three days. But today it's going to be the day that this works. Now, <laughs> and then the phone rings. <laughs> Pardon me, I got a phone call. Hey, I'm super busy doing an interview. <laughs> 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 got 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 to love live stuff, guys. Anyways, I'm Ryan Block. I am the curator of this wonderful little show called the Open Heart Collective. The Open Heart Collective is a podcast focused around mental health because we're not having these conversations often enough, guys. We we live in a world where being an entrepreneur is glorified. Hustling 24 seven is paramount. Like you got to do it right. Elon Musk says hundred hours a week, right? But yet the one thing that we are not hustling for, the one thing that we are not on the offense for, the one thing that we're not hundred hours a week for is our own mental health and the mental health of those in and around our communities. So what's the way that we can fix this? The way that we can fix this is to fucking talk about it. So my guest tonight is, uh, doesn't really need an introduction because he's a fucking legend, but is none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Colby K. So when we're talking about mental health, we're not just focusing on the negative, right? We could always focus on the dark times. We could focus on the struggle. We could focus on all of that, right? But I want to take it a little bit deeper than that. So when we talk about story, and we're going to get into Colby's story here in, here in a minute, we're not just going to talk about the story, but not just the struggle, but what he did to overcome those struggles and those obstacles, right? And then as we get ready to wrap up, we're going to talk about what's exciting in his world. Because in, for anybody out there who's struggling, they need to know that there is light on the other side of the dark, right? So that being said, with no further ado, Colby, let's hear your story. Long time listener. First time caller. It's really good to be on the show. Thanks for having me. So, can we just talk about this lighting in my hair for a second? What's going on, man? That's right. Growing my you hair look out. Beautiful, man. I'm going to do a tutorial on how to do nice hair with my uh, ring light. Get your comb and your hair products out, dudes. I smell right. musty on the construction site, but I've got handsome hair. So, can we just start there? Absolutely, man. <laughs> Wherever you are. What is up? I'm uh, I'm honored to be on the show. You know, we we've done this a couple of times. We've tried to we've attempted to do this. You know, any any time I can get in front of a new audience or, or talk to right. somebody about my story, it's it's always a big deal for me. Um, this topic, you know, I've talked numerous times now about the importance of it, and where it fits in my life. But I'm just first and foremost, man, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's my honor, brother. So uh, about me, the uh, the condensed version. Well, we've got an hour, so you can be as condensed as you want. Okay. Well, um, I, I, let's talk about, and even if we want to do some Q&A, I'd be open for that too. The, no. uh, who am I? I was born and raised in Salt Lake City. Uh, what, what, like, let, me, let me start by who am I. So who am I and what my story is? Uh, best-selling author, entrepreneur, uh, software developer, designer, investor, um, above everything that I do, though, is uh, a music producer. Uh, above it all, I'm a, I'm a father first, right. and uh, I'm, a, I'm a human just trying to figure out what my place is on this big kind of planet that we call Earth, this big rock. But that's who I am at the base. I've, been, uh, I've always been the underdog and the kid that was told you were never going to make it, and uh, mm -hmm. I've used that as my advantage to get through things. I've used it as power. I've used it as fuel. I've used it as gas to kind of push me through some of those dark times. And it's those stories that people relate to. People don't want to know when you're at the top of the mountain. They want to know like the journey to get to the top of the mountain. And sometimes right. people don't give a shit that you climb. They just want to know that you're getting ready. So there's, there's different aspects of my story that people relate to. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen Ty Lopez, right? You know the Ty Lopez in the garage? Yep. So one of my, especially in the social kind of sphere that we live in, where people know me from that don't know me from my music business days or my corporate days are right. from, I was in my kitchen and I had a here in my kitchen moment where it wasn't as glamorous as Ty Lopez. It was actually the opposite of that. It was the, 
I started a software company. I, lo- I left a Fortune 500 company as a, vi- as a vice president, uh, managing a $500 million budget that I had built, this business I had built to walk away to start a software company, and I got sued. And I lost everything. I mean, there was no plan B. All the money was into the into the software. We had about eight hundred thousand dollars of revenue. I took six months to ex- to to exit corporate America. Um, I had a strategic exit plan. And when I left, I got sued. And I mean, I lost everything. So my video was me in the kitchen, very much like where I, what I where I'm at now. He said I had a bunch of boxes with all my stuff piled behind me. And I started with I don't know what I'm going to do. Wife's leaving. Um, it was before I got diagnosed with Lyme disease. So it's like the wife was leaving. We were selling that house and I didn't know what I was going to do because we had zero money and I had no income and I'd been blackballed from an industry. And it was, I I filmed the video every day for, I don't know, two and a half years or so and just took people on a journey as to what I was going to do and how I went through that. Um, And I was blessed and honored, man. I've created over 17,000 pieces of original content and I've, I've hit over 30 million impressions in three years. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I found you. I mean, that it was all that organic business, man. All, all that organic impressions and just connecting with because I mean we've been connected for what two and a half years. Two and a half years, yeah, at, at least. So, I mean, you hit on what was some dark times right there. You, come on, guys. You imagine being sued and literally losing everything. Well, I mean, I, let's put it into perspective, dude. Is you know, I grew up with the mattress on the floor. Uh, one of the things I want to be sure that we do is a lot of people have heard my story. So for those of you that are tuning in the first 10 minutes, you've heard some of this. The rest of the stuff that we talk about, I really want it to be different things that we that I haven't talked about based on the topic set of today's interview. The uh, I grew up with the mattress on the floor. I had two loving parents that were just amazing. Um, they divorced and they showed me hard work and, and love like as I was coming up. They divorced when I was 13 and I was left to kind of my own my own thing. And got myself into a you and me trouble. too, man. My my parents divorced at thirteen. That's a confusing. Thanks. Right, so yeah. I, had a younger bro- I had an eight-year-old brother, and at the time, it's like it was just a super confusing time. Like you think you're part of the right. problem, you think maybe you're the reason your parents got divorced. Parents get divorced. You know, I played both parents to the middle, bounced around a lot, had a mattress on the floor, got into a bunch of just stupid juvenile stuff. Nothing like big. I mean, it didn't hurt anybody. Just stupid things. And just yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I got into the music business. Um, I'd started on an organic kind of marketing agency in 1999, 1998, with my buddy Mike Saltzman and this guy Brian called Baseline Shift, where we were booking music shows and acts. That led into the music industry. I spent 10 years there as a booking agent and manager for some bands like Outkast and Ludacris and The Roots, all the way up to the Olympics. And then I became a single dad, young. I got married young, became a single dad young, and got divorced pretty fast. I got full right. custody of my daughter when she was one, and then I had to make a decision. Like, did I want to be a rock star? Or did I want to be a father? And that was an easy decision for me, so I chose to be the father right. uh, that I knew I should be, and I moved to Phoenix from Salt Lake City. So I didn't know anything but, like, kind of struggle and working and building my own. I didn't know what it was like to work for other people. I had a lot of different odd jobs, like bartending and serving tables, right. but... I started to get my stride when I was 1920, like building my own little agency. I'm 43, so for all you pups that are just coming into this marketing agency shit, I've been doing. Some of us have been doing it a little bit. And the um, I got into corporate America, dude, and it was like a scene out of the movie Broiler Room, mm-hmm. where like you walk in, and it's a bunch of guys and girls on like in suits, like on the phone, right? And it was at a call center selling technology to, to businesses. So when I walked into that, man, it was like sports car after sports car after sports car. And here I was in this little beat up, like, you know, Nissan S10 truck. And I was like, man, like, this is not it. Like, I got to, I got to figure out how to do what they do. So I attached mm-hmm. myself to the top performers. I said, what do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? And, you know, one of my skill sets and superpowers is you just can't outwork me. Like I'll work, outwork anybody. I'm not, that's not that I'm really smart. It's just that I'm, I ask a lot of questions and I'm humble enough to know what I don't know. Right. And, you know, so fast forward, all of these things are happening. I get to some pretty big milestones through my corporate career. Then my goal went from money, from financial to being, it was status driven. Like I wanted to be a vice, uh, an executive. Um, right. I wanted to be a shareholder at that point. It, all executives had stock. And as a kid who had a mattress on the floor, that was a big deal. Right. So we that process. But then I found that there was a need within this community that I was selling to, that they were trying to figure out how to track the software usage. So it, I went to my mm-hmm. organization for 
two years trying to say, hey, like we need to fix this. And they kept saying no. And every day I spoke to customers and said it was a problem. So I learned how to write software watching YouTube videos. And um, I hired some overseas <laughs> guys to help me kind of get it across the line. And then as, I, as we were kind of going through it, I realized we had a real business. I had a test, a couple of test environments. It worked. I raised a little bit of capital uh, just to scale out the line. Next thing you know, we had $800,000 of paying customers. And then I transitioned out. In the middle of all that, I get remarried. I have three beautiful, three more kids. So I've got four total. I have three beautiful kids. But I, we built a house from the ground up. Right. right. So we've never had a house. like that. I mean, I lived in houses, but we didn't own a house. We pick in the cabinets and the tile, the countertop tiles, and you know the knobs on the mm-hmm. on the towers, and you know how tall do you want the cabinets to be? And in my office, like the what kind of flooring do I want in the office? I had an office very similar to what you have there, and it's right. um, and then and I also have my music production stuff, my music production stuff, my business stuff, my creative stuff. I had it all in one room, and right then here. yeah, and, and my kids. I mean, my kids only know that area. They're still in that area. They only knew those kids on that street. They all grew up together. And then here I am, I come home one day and I'm like, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do this full time. And that had some support there and then left. And when I, when I say lose everything, it's like I lost everything. I mean, the house, the cars, I mean, everything. And it's like when you spend all that time building up to get that and then all of a sudden you lose it, it was, um, it was, an int- it was really interesting to see kind of what happened after that. But that's where a lot of people know me is they know me from after that. Like, what did I do after that? Right. <sighs> there are a few things that we that we, we talked about off air that I want to talk about here. I mean, with growing up, parents splitting up early, much like mine, um, you had mentioned to me that your your parents had suffered with some mental problems mm-hmm. or mental mental health issues and, and and that's obviously got to impact you in in some way shape or form that's molded you into who you are right now so what what was that like not necessarily being that you had to struggle with mental health yourself but watching those that you loved and looked up to struggle with it because i think a lot of people out there that are in those environments where they're the parent watching the child or the child watching the parents or this person connecting with that person i I, i've i've upset colby and he's left (laughs) i'm out of here no dude how did i not know that my thing wasn't plugged in in the back it's like your battery's about to die i'm like not today suckers (laughs) we've already had enough technical issues uh, I, I think that it's it's interesting. And let me answer the question this way: Is when I'm on stages and I've done this now in front of twenty thousand people, and I've done it in front of a room of two hundred people, I start by saying, "By you do a word association game. You're a loser. You're a moron. You're an idiot. Those are bad ideas. You're never going to make it." As I start to use those words, the word association, I say, "If these words have been used at you, to you, or in your direction, like need you to stand up." Right. And as I do that, what you notice is 99% of the room is that's what, right, standing up. Yep. And when you look around, you see – we think that our problems are our problems and we're the only ones that have ever gone through them. So yep. we isolate ourselves and put ourselves in this little bucket, and what we don't do is we don't reach out for help. Mm-hmm. Reaching out for help doesn't mean like, hey, man, I'm having some problems here. It's understanding first and foremost that there's like we're not the only ones that are struggling. So the first piece is understanding that everybody's going through their own shit. Nobody has the stuff figured out. I didn't really understand that until like probably the last handful of years, right? So just as I grew up, just like you did and and, and the viewers that are watching, you had somebody around you. Maybe it's you or your parents. We're all, all have issues, right? So Mm -hmm. my parents' issues didn't really start to translate to me until I started really paying attention to them. And part of it was matched with substance abuse, alcoholism, prescription pain medications, and it was them trying to hide and mask their own depressions where it got so bad with my mom. Like we'd have to go to the house to get her out. Like she would disappear. My mom was one of my all time, if not my favorite person on the planet that showed me what it was like and taught me unconditional love. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things where she was the hardest working person I knew. And then she would just disappear. Right. So very much like me, I'm very manic and excited, but I can get just as sad too. And not want to ever leave the house. Like I sometimes have to talk myself into just getting fresh air to kind of Mm -hmm. reset. 
So my mom would disappear. So we'd have my brother and I would figure out like, you know, when was the last time we told we'd coordinate? When was the last time we talked to her? Have you seen her late, lately? One of us would go over and see her. And it wasn't until the end, um, she died a really, she had a really tragic kind of death. Um, and so did my dad. I, I lost both my parents within three months of each other um, two years ago. This is coming up on three. Uh, and we just had the three year anniversary. And that changes you, that rewires you. Harvard has a study that came out that says by the age of 26, the way you make decisions is kind of the way you're going to make decisions. You're wired at that point, emotionally, right. spiritually, sexually, the things that you've gone through at that point, you're wired that way moving forward. Unless one of three things happens to you. Um, let's start with health. You have a health issue. Right. Okay. If you know, I like to use cancer because that's one that would be if people have ever had anybody in their family or neighborhood or it, so, you know, it destroys everything in its path. And mm -hmm. it, it changes people. Like it changes everybody. It changes the family. It changes the people who are going through it. Uh, so, so health first. The second one would be money. Like if you lost a job or you lost a bank account, like you're down to nothing. Like that, it, you scramble. It, it rewires you. Or a heartbreak. Like if you go through a major, like just heartbreak, whether it's you know a divorce or you know whatever it is, whatever the relationship is, it splits apart. Well, I had all three of those things happen to me twice and within like a two year period. And it was like, it just flipped me upside down. So with, with my mother, um, we knew that my mom had different, she was very kind of manic. But one of the things that my mom did really well was she like, she would do things that made her feel better when she was in the darkest times that she could like muster herself up to. Right. Meaning for her, she would get her hair done. She'd go get her nails done. Um, for me, when I get into a funk and I feel it to where it's like I'm getting angry, like I'm getting I'm, I'm getting stressed, like I'm really starting to struggle with even just like um, mortality as a whole. There's, right. there's I do that help me get out of that because it's a chemical imbalance. It, whatever, whatever people want to say, it is. There's a serotonin imbalance inside your brain that you have to be able to you, – you control that. So for me, my car, I need to go outside. I got to be outside. Second piece is I need to be around the sun. If I can't go outside in the sun, I'll go to a tanning bed. I'll go tanning just to get sun on my skin because it does something to my psyche. Then I get a haircut. Okay. Those three things, if I go outside, get some sun, and get a haircut, even if it's just a neck trim. I've been to the barber. I've been to the barber like when shit was getting really heavy for me, even recently through my divorce. I went to the barber every four days. And he's like, dude, I can't. I was just like, I need a neck trim. I need a shave. Just a cleanup because when I was done, right. In the barber chair after that straight razor was on my skin and I felt fresh. It's like getting a new pair of shoes. It's like, you know, like you don't have to shop to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Those things help get my serotonin levels right. New so, tattoos. Yep. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I, I hate getting tattooed. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> my guy who had some money. But, you know, from seeing my parents, I would see my mom go through some pretty dark stuff and then I would see what she yeah. would do to try to get through it. But it's when you grow up in that it's, it's, um, it's, it's scary. You know, it's one of those things you don't really understand it and realize it until it's too much. And then uh, my mom had a really bad alcohol problem at the end and she kind of gave up. She fell down some stairs and hit her head and never came out of that. So it was like, it sped up Al Alzheimer's. She fell down like a two flight of stairs and hit, hit her at the back of her head, the side of her head on a metal railing. And when they found her, her, I think she was four or five times over the legal limit. Like she shouldn't have been alive just from the alcohol she had in her system. Wow. But what happened was it pickled her brain because she hit her head so hard and there was so much alcohol in her system. She never came like fully, she never came out of it. Right. And so I started, I would talk to her and she just didn't know. Like she, she was, she had a memory bank that was at a specific set time and she didn't build new memories on top of that. So mm -hmm. she wouldn't talk about my kids now because she didn't really, that wasn't where her mind was. It was back when my oldest daughter was young. Right. So like, she would ask me and then about my brother. She would ask me about stuff about my younger brother when he was like 21, you know, he's 35. Mm -hmm. So it's like she was stuck in this pattern and then she passed. It was, she was in a, like a, an old folks rehab center for like two years and she just right. slowly deteriorated. And then a couple months later, man, I got the call. I flew there and she passed like while I was in the air, which is like one of those, like, you know, to identify your mother at the morgue is like pretty shitty. Mm -hmm. So three months after that, my dad had a similar instance where he, um, uh, they were divorced and he, he lived in Idaho. She was in Florida. And I got a call. My dad was in the hospital. He's in a coma. And I went and saw my dad and he had, he had oxygen issues like with his blood. He served um, a few tours in Vietnam. He was a special forces army vet. Never talked about his time in the service. I didn't learn about his time in the service, about what he did till he was gone, which is kind right. of crazy. But he had oxygen issues. 
um, in his blood for, from I don't know what, but his he never his his blood would never oxygenate the right way, so his brain would start to shut down. They fed him in the front yard, passed like blacked out, had a bunch of pain medicine in him, didn't have enough oxygen in, and was like oxycodone on the front yard, and he was in a coma. Like we were going to say our goodbyes to him, and my brother who hadn't seen him in ten years, I had seen him and talked to him. Um, we drove out to Idaho, and he woke up while my brother and I were there. It was responsive and came too, and we were cracking jokes. And he was like, "We were having a conversation, like we're having a conversation now." Right. And I stayed there a week and a half. They were getting ready to move him into a like a, a rehab facility, mm-hmm. then move him home. And the day I left, I got a call that night saying your dad passed. And it was like, "What?" I mean, I was literally just there. Like I was literally just by my dad's bedside. I just saw him. So you, know, you take those, and then you fast forward that six, seven months later. And I go through a divorce that involved a lot of really heavy things, right? You know, a divorce comes from two sides of relationships that aren't necessarily working, but um, it kind of came full circle where it was like, this isn't working. I came home and next thing you know, like all my ex-wife's stuff and the kids' shit's packed and I'm getting served papers within three days of that happening, two, three days of that happening. And I was like, it was good. I thought it was good until you're alone. And then when you're alone for dark periods of time and everything, all of our assets were frozen. I couldn't do anything. So I just left. I left everything in the house and left. And it's like, that's when I, it's really, everything kind of dawned on me. I walked away from a studio, film studio that I was a partner in. I walked away from clients that were paying me a shit ton of money to do social media and help them do like build their branding. And I walked away. I don't walk away, but the, the marriage and all I've known is being a dad. So all of that stuff right. kind of decom- like all came apart at the same time. And it was, um, it's been six months now, dude. Six months now. It's in May, May, wow. January, August, September, October, November. Yeah, so six months. And it, it's crazy, you know, growing up and dealing with things, stuff with the parents, and then the divorce. It's like those different levels. Like most of the stuff that I think most mm-hmm. of us have been through would kill most normal people, but we keep going. I don't know anything else. That's that's it. But how do you do it? I, I don't know how I do. I don't know how not to do it. I mean. We're and 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 this is. I don't want to get this twisted. This is not a show where we're talking about how those people who are quote unquote entrepreneurs. This this is not that show. But I can attest that people like Colby and myself are wired differently. Yes, I don't. I can't go and plug in nine to five somewhere and 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 be okay. That in fact is actually a further detriment to my own mental health. Yep. I mean. Oh yeah. I, I mean, here's the thing, Ryan is I, 99% of people are not made to do that. Right. Um, if anybody listening has that feeling inside of them that they feel like they're built for something more than what they're doing today, every day that they wake up are kind of like, Oh, that's, that's all. That's that entrepreneur spirit. What it is when you really dive into it, you kind of pull that apart. That's the human spirit. You know, the purpose of life is love and experience and, it's to go out and do things. It's not to be sitting at a job, like working for somebody else. It's about freedom. Right. We're here for freedom. We're here for freedom, love and life. And that feeling that all of us have is to go out and actually live the life that we're supposed to be doing. It's fear that keeps us plugged into that desk. The ones that break away and say, like, I risk everything all the time. And people are like, you don't you get tired of risking and losing. And I said, no, right. I, I don't know any other way. Right. Right. It's so there's my entrepreneur plug for the day. <laughs> All right, so we're about the midway point, and and this this is where we I, I want to make a um, a plea to anybody out there who may be listening to this now live with us. Kudos to you guys, thank you. Or is going to catch it, or is catching this as part of the audio replay, or the uh, the YouTube session that we're going to launch uh, over the weekend with this with this video. Um, if you are one of those people who are struggling. We're here to help. Myself, I am here to help. Not that I can, not that I want to offer you guys advice. So I don't want to get it twisted. I'm here to listen. Because when you're struggling, when you've got that blade to your wrist or that pill bottle in your hand or that rope, the last thing you want is somebody telling you what to do. You want somebody to listen to you and empathize with you. That's what you want. Yep. I'm tired of waking up every day and reading about losing someone. In my in my home um, county, right, little old Winnebago County here in northern Illinois, 
which by the way, we've got like a foot of snow. So if you need the, you need know, a little break to the cold, you're more than welcome, brother. Anyways, from August, from January to the end of August this year, in this county, one county in one state, in one country, we lost 39 people to suicide. The, this is a real problem. And, I, and I'm telling you guys this because the only way this problem is going to get better is, is if we do something about it. There is no amount of legislation sitting on any president of any country's desk that can fix this problem. It's us. I don't want to see those idols that we look up to, the Anthony Bourdain's, the Kate Spades, the Chester Bennington's, Mac Miller's of the world, struggle. And I sure as fuck don't want to hear my, see my neighbors struggling. Or God forbid, our kids struggle. This is how this gets fixed. By talking about it inside of safe places. And this community, the Open Heart Collective, is one of those safe places where we don't judge you. We're here for you. We're here to support you. So if you're struggling and you don't want to necessarily share your story publicly like Colby and I are doing right now, I ask you to reach out to me. I make myself so available that my own fucking cell phone, this one right here, uh, that you guys in the video can see, but the audio, you guys can't see this. This phone right here is literally in my Instagram profile. You can fucking call me. Point being, guys, we can fix this, and I know we can. And it's going to obviously take time. But if you are somebody that's struggling and you need it, we're here, and you're not alone. All right. I have to get that in midway because, I mean, we're talking for an hour and sometimes people don't stick around for a whole hour. Um, it's the, I mean, there, there's one person. Everything I do, we've talked about this. Everything I do is to impact one person. If one person's life can be changed by something I do each day, then it's worth right. getting out of bed for me. So if there, there's one person that's listening to today's show that can relate to anything that we're talking about, that's the show is for you. So yeah, it, yeah. Whoever, whoever that is, um, I probably, I don't, you know, we don't know who you are. I mean, it would mean the world if any part of this has helped you. Right. Uh, shoot us, shoot one of us a message or both of us a message. We're both like super available. So absolutely. I'd love to hear. Love to hear. So going through all of those dark times, right? All of those struggles, all those obstacles being th just thrown at you. How did you, how did you get past it? Because like you, you yourself said it. You survived what would kill most normal people. I think most recently it's been a couple things, right? I mean, you said something powerful about kids. And as, as I'm going through the, just the, the divorce I just went through, I'm, it'll be finished here in the next like uh, December 2nd and 16th are the last dates so when everything's been finalized. Okay, like, what's going to happen? It's going to happen. The, for me, I was never really like a big substance dude. Like I've always kind of pushed the limits and experimented and I'm very into kind of understanding the full aspects of how my brain works. Right. It turned into like, I was literally just drinking like a bottle of whiskey every other day. I never got drunk though, which is really weird. It was like, I just sustained being buzzed. Like I just wake up drinking and right. that went on for a little while. The food, like not eating right and like just sleeping. And it's like, being around people that allowed me to do that, like just do it. Don't hurt yourself, but you, you, you're in a grieving period. Like you need to be able to grieve and there's nothing wrong with you. Like just get through it. Like just each day you got a pillow, you got a blanket. You might not have any money enough to show for, but you got a place to lay down and like recoup. Like it take advantage of that. Get people around you to love you. So like take advantage of that. So it started there and then it slowly, I just got sick of being like feeling shitty. So it's like, okay, enough is enough. It gets pretty dark and then it's like, you know, okay, enough. What are the things I can do that make me feel better? Um, progression, making my bed and like starting with like making a difference, moving and, and like reaching out to people and telling people I care about them. And you know, I have little things that I do that, that help me. You can't be in a state. Um, I'll send you a link for a video that um, Tony Robbins did with uh, for the audience. I did an interview with um, Tim Ferriss where he talks about you can't be in a state of gratitude as, and, um, and kind of being angry and upset at the same time. So how do you, over 90 seconds, what are some things you can do to actually jump into a stage of appreciation versus depression? Right. So you know, it's, it's thinking of the things that you're truly grateful for, and it's really hard to do that when you're in a really, really dark place. And mm -hmm. you know, for me, I started thinking about my kids, and I remember when my parents split up, 
I don't know that I ever got permission to like feel. It's like everybody just kind of told me what was going on. Um, I, I didn't ever really know what was going on, but nobody ever talked to me about feelings. Like my parents, that day and age, like we didn't grow up like that. And our parents didn't grow up like that, right? It's like you're kind of- I was, of oddly then. enough though, I was blessed that my parents were both like overly empathetic. Were they? But that was both a blessing and a curse because they also spoke their mind. So mm -hmm. empathy comes with no filter. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. Yeah, your parents ever get along. I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah. But I, in the middle of things that were going on, I brought all three of my kids, my three youngest kids. I've got four. I brought my three youngest kids. Um, I had them on a weekend. And I could just tell they were struggling. And I was looking at my own struggles where they had never seen their dad cry. Like there was always jokes about their dad was a robot because I just didn't show emotion. And I've cried more in front of my kids in the last six months I probably have in my entire life combined cried. I want, I want, to, I want to pause real quick. I'm fucking proud of you for that. Oh, thanks, man. Because well, let's talk about how critical that is for a dad to do that in front of his kids. Because well, oftentimes the men are like, oh, we're, we're just pff, robots. Yeah. We're like, yeah. Yeah. no, I, I, I've had, I have a story that I, that all you can tell here in a minute, but. Well, I grabbed, yeah, all, that's I grabbed so all three kids, dude, and I asked them until they were struggling. And I said, how do you feel? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you confused? Are you heartbroken? Do you not know how you feel? Are you angry? And right. I went over just every emotion. Are you happy? And it, it started with my daughter, uh, the oldest one uh, of the three years. I have a 20-year-old and then a, an eight-year-old. Uh, and so the eight-year-old started crying. She started crying, and I just let her go. I held her tight, and I said, keep going. Go. Get all of that out because all of those feelings are valid. They're good feelings. This is really good for you to do this. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm crying. She's crying. And then I brought my son right. over. I did the same thing with my son. And I'm like, I love you. And the feeling is like, how do you feel? And he didn't have words. And we went through the same thing. And I said, there's nothing wrong that we're in a good place. I love you. And the way you feel is okay. Like, it's okay. And he just started bawling. And then the baby, he's three. He doesn't even know what's going on. He just starts crying. He jumps on my lap and hugs me. He starts crying. He sees his brother and sister crying. He's just going to start. He feels the emotions coming out. And um, right. it was legitimate. Like he was crying. He cried so hard he fell asleep at the floor, on the floor at my feet on the couch. And it was one of those things where I had to explain like the times are different. The day-to-day -day is different. But the things that will never change are my love for you and the feelings that you have now are valid. And right. I think what happens when you start to look at depression – like you mentioned some famous people and being in the music business, I got to tell you, like it was a heavy year for me when like we had a really heavy year when, when, when Chris Cornell died, that was a big deal to me. And I, well, I'm in the music project. business too. So I worked with Chris twice on two different projects and I'd never met a dude who was more like just empathetic and sympathetic and sweet and quiet and talented in my life than Chris Cornell. And I can't say that we were friends, but I was blessed enough to spend time with him. Right? We didn't hang out outside the studio sessions. And then it was Robin Williams. It was like Robin Williams. It was Chris Cornell and then, um, Chester Bennington. Then it was Bourdain. And when Bourdain, when Robin Williams died and then Cornell died, I was like, what? And then Bourdain died. And Mac Miller's was an accidental overdose. He didn't kill himself. It's like I, I know, I know, and I but know he I, had I struggles, I which do. led to it was fentanyl. Fentanyl killed him. It killed Prince. Killed Michael. It killed um, Tom Petty. Like we have a drug problem too. So it's like we we try to we get the press to try to escape through. Today's section sponsored by eight hundred five. But when <laughs> and you, we try to mask things. But when I saw those things happening, it was like wow. Like those were big things to me. I thought about my own space because in the middle of the divorce, I thought how much weight can that? If there was there was literally a time where I was in a closet on the floor crying, thinking like it can't get any worse than this. And uh, I looked at the, at the closet rod and thought like, how much weight can that hold? And I looked around, I was like, I always have scarves. Like I always have these big long scarves that I've worn, the military scarves for like the desert or the snow. I'm like, I can tie that around my neck. I think I'll hold a horse together. I've seen it. I've like, they're made for tourniquets. Like they're not, they're made to hold a shit ton of weight. And I looked at the bar and I was like, legitimately thought, how much weight can that thing hold? And it was right in the middle of all these things, the things that pulled me back were my kids and that conversation with my kids about it's okay to have these feelings. And then mm -hmm. I thought, well, what am I feeling? Do I even know? And then I just let it all out. It was like, you know what? Like there, every day I just – like you said, we just have to keep going. Right. 
just have to be going. And I, I don't know why I got up out, off that floor. I don't know why I took, I literally had the, um, the scarf in my hand tied up, like to do, to see, like just to test it, like how much weight can this thing hold? And then right. I, I, as I was getting ready, all those emotions flush out. And it's that moment of truth. It's like, you're going to go through with it. And the only thing I think about were my kids and the fact that I know that I'm not supposed to be doing that, that there's something right. else. I'm for. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, when I've always been an overly emotional person, it's been a blessing and a curse all at the same time, because I, I remember one instance, um, my son, oh God, my, I think my son was like 18 months. No, just turned two. And so you, I mean, you remember the two year old, like the, the cutest fucking things. So empathetic. They just love endless everything yep, yep. without any regard for themselves my and and this was when my ex and i were going through one of our darkest periods and she had struggled with a lot um which is another reason why i'm i've got a louder voice in this realm um and i was done at the time i was i was at my worst as a human being uh, and a sure as fuck was not being a dad. And I um, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, you know, those old Marlboro Reds. Mm -hmm. And um, I was drinking a bottle of bourbon probably every other day, right? So half a bottle a day. I was 250 pounds. I was a fucking, sh I was a shell, man. I was in a, I was in an organization. I was in a, industry that I loved. I was in investment planning. I was working with clients and I, I, I loved it, but I hated who I was doing it for. And I don't even use that word. That's nope. my least favorite word right out there right now. Right. But I despised it. And with my ex going through with what she was going through, I was just like, fuck, I'm done. I was getting like, my house was starting to get foreclosed on. Like I was losing everything. Right, my client base diminished because I couldn't be at work because or at my office because my I was having to take care of my kids because my ex was in and out of therapy. Like I just broke down in the corner of my kitchen one night and my son walks up to me, a little cute two year old walk. We all we all know what that looks like. And 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 says, Daddy, what's wrong? And I mean, hell, even thinking about it right now, I'm getting emotional again, but I just fucking lost it. And from then, I think he knew that being able to allow yourself to feel was important. I mean, hell, he's seen me cry. He's seen me yell. He's seen, I probably cursed in front of them more than I probably should. But like, it's... I allow them to know that it's okay to feel things. If it hurts, it, it, that's okay. If it feels good, that's okay too. But you have to allow yourself to feel and move through circumstances. Like, because life isn't easy, but allowing yourself to know what it's like to feel something is so critical. Yep. And I mean, I chase happiness all the time, right? But there are times where it's like, fuck it. I just want to like, I don't give a shit about anything. I'm just like loathing, not wanting to do a damn thing, but knowing that I have to, mm -hmm. you know, because the work is important, regardless of what the work is, right? It's the podcast. It's being a dad. It's running my marketing agency. It's running my record label. It's this show. You guys don't know how much this fucking show has helped me like yeah we're getting to help other people but every day every week this show helps me this is my therapy All right <sighs> let's let let's talk about the exciting stuff right let's do because it because th this is the key part that a lot of people lose in the in the mental health discussion like I, like I was saying at the beginning, we always can focus on the dark, right? We can focus on the struggles. We can focus on those fucking obstacles that are always going to pop up. 
But if we're not paying attention to the exciting things, it's a cycle of negativity and darkness that's just not going to allow you to win. So that being said, my man, I want to hear that exciting shit. I want to know what the fuck's going on in your world that's exciting. I call that – it's the uh, vulnerability masturbation where everybody sits around and talks about how (laughs) shitty their life is. It's like, fuck that, dude. I don't want to be around that group of people. We all got shit that's like wrong. I'm okay talking about it. But there's, there's a really fine line about, like, I just barely started kind of saying something about my divorce. Or what I'm really like sensitive to is I don't want to seem like a victim. Like, I would have everything to do with this thing, too. Like, I don't want it to be like a woe was me. It's not a woe was me. It's not like a right. dad's, you know, dad's advocacy thing. It's like, yes, of course, this was fucked up. Yes, a complete stranger's telling me what, how what it means to be a dad now. But like, I'm in this too. It's like, we'll figure out what the next steps are and go forward. So right. being able to talk about things is one thing. Having a safe space to do it's another. But then also knowing when to say, like, all right, enough. Like, okay, like uh, enough bitching. Like, let's figure out what the solution is. In right. my business, I would never let employees come and complain. If you're going to come to the office and, and voice a complaint, you need to have a solution behind it. Whether we implemented the solution, mm-hmm. I needed to know you had to, you were thinking about a, a problem and a solution that needed to do. Like, how to fix that. So right. for, for me, happiness, dude, has always been in building and producing. <clears throat> you know, this as a musician and being in the music world, creating is a big deal. I, I've got, you know, uh, there's not, I, I think we're blessed when you have the creative side, plus you have the analytical side, because most people don't mm-hmm. have both. To where for me, creating is makes me happy. Painting, writing music, doing video editing, like the stuff that's creating is always important to me. Right. So on one side of that, I've got a handful of kind of projects. There's um, a new company that my buddy Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank just bought into. It's a solar flashlight company. Oh, nice. I, I saw that stuff over on your Instagram. Yeah, it's super, super cool. So I literally met that dude last week. It was in St. George, Utah. We filmed a bunch of videos. And now I'm literally going to do probably 10 or 15 videos on solar powered like lanterns and flashlights that all have USB chargers in them. Oh, nice. I'm creating, I'm creating again, which is very big. The flip side of it, I have a, a mentor and a good friend of mine who I, I've completely changed industries. Um, people didn't know I had anything to do with real estate, let alone renovations and all the other stuff. Well, that, uh, behind the curtains, I've been learning. I'm a student. So finding stuff that excites me is new stuff. So instead of just buying and selling properties from like a flip perspective, put together a team of like 45 people and serve as a general contractor to where when we buy or sell eight, eight properties that they want to flip them, I bring my team in. And now it's like I'm literally sitting down at the drawing board and I'll, we're looking at, okay, counters and cabinets and knock this wall out, open this up. And I'm able to use my artistic side, which I've always been draw- – I've been drawing it since I was six, right? Me so too. I'm able to sit down and say I can see it the way I think it should be without having to watch an HGTV show on what I think a good house would look like. And then I bring in my guys. <laughs> I bring my guys in and say, okay, we need to knock this, the ceiling out. And then as we're knocking it out, I'm learning in real time. Like when there's a false ceiling, what are the things that are going to get you? You don't know until you knock the ceilings out. So right. in one world, I'm doing some of the creative stuff on the videos. And I mean, I'm going to start doing my stuff again, which I took a break for like five months. I just got overwhelmed with this shit life. And it's yeah. okay. When shit's happening, just fucking stop. Stop. You don't have to keep doing like this facade of like bullshit. Just fucking stop. stop. I, I did. I had recorded, what, 170 episodes of a, of a vlog. But you, I mean, my, my style is this raw, real. I'm not producing shit and like i'm telling you guys in real time as things are going on and we're having conversation about it but i stopped because this right here what we're working on right now has become more important yeah it was um i remember i sort of i was doing paint i was doing gallery shows i was doing eight or nine gallery shows a month at one point and i remember coming out into my front room and the process that i do to paint is really unique where i've got a specific style and a look and then i do wood bot plant prints and then i do screen prints on top of wood so mm-hmm. I like, I'll screen print the same image on uh, like 45 different sizes of things and then I do all kinds of stuff to it. I remember coming out to the front room and I had like five months of shows booked out with the art already sold that I hadn't even been to yet and I stopped. And they were like, I had an interview with this magazine called Juxtapose and they were like, well, what happened to you? Like, what, what do you mean you just stopped? They did, did a write up on me and I was like, well, I came out into the living room and just decided I was done. I didn't want to do it anymore. And that was the same thing with all the social media shit I was doing. It's yeah. people, my ex-wife used to bag on me. I, I, I don't want to talk negative about people in my life, but I, I want to use this as an example because I know you like you've probably heard this too. And you're mm-hmm. listening. Now. Why do you post that positive shit all the time? You don't feel that way inside. 
And I'm like, I post that positive shit online so it gets me to feel that way. That's why I do it. I'm not doing it to say that this is who I am. I'm doing this to give myself <clears> more. <throat> day. Like when right. I, make sure I go to the gym and I eat right and get my workouts in, I'm doing this as part of the things I need to do to get momentum to do those things. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it because I'm pretending to live that way. I'm doing it to make sure I stay on track. And you don't self accountability, people. Accountability. And guess what? You don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe your parents shit. You don't owe your friends shit. You don't owe anybody anything. Let's it, your kids, right? Like for me, I have this like weird line of things, but if I'm not right, I can't take care of my kids either. So right. it's one of those things where for me, cre the creation has been really good, dude. So I'm, I'm coming into a new industry with real estate and um, doing all kinds of renovations and stuff and sharing that and showcasing that's been fun. I'm doing some creative videos for some of my buddies' companies again, which you know I loved doing that before. Right. So it, it's kind of getting out of my own way to remember what it's like to be happy um, helps you get out of that funk. Right. Amen, guys. Come like, I mean, I know we don't have a bunch of people like there, but and there's not like a massive audience, but I mean, that's it. Because it that's I mean, look, guys, that was a journey we just went through, right? We talked about we we talked about the, the bed on the floor. We we talked about the parents' struggle. Right, that that rolled over the divorce, the 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 tumultuous teen years. Then we talked about our own relationship struggles, which, let's face it, all of us have them. None of us are perfect because it's called being a human, right? And then we and we and we get to make and we make mistakes. We learn from those mistakes, and we adapt, we grow, and we overcome. Because we're always destined to do amazing things. It's our own limitations that we put on ourselves and what we can do and what we can't. I, I say this when I'm talking around my, uh, my agency world. Me, my team, what we can do, we are limitless, right? But the only thing that limits us is our clients, right? Because it's their perception. Because we can make anything happen. The show. The show is a fucking prime example of making anything happen. I said, we're not having this discussion enough. That was eight months ago and 35 show episodes ago. No, 36, 37 episodes ago. Come on, guys. You can do this, right? And if you can't, call Colby, call me, and I'll slap you upside the head and tell you you can't. It's on us to make it better. It's on us to go after what we want, whatever that, whatever that is. And it's not on me to tell you what you should want. You should fucking know. I mean, <clears throat> we could circle the drain on this all night. I mean, th this could be an eight hour long episode. And you guys are probably listen. But I want you to know that we are here. All you have to do is reach out. I want you to know that we're trying to fix the problem, right? Because I know one of the things that's a problem when it comes to mental health, and I want to talk to you guys about it for a second. The thing that we struggle with, because, or the, the base of all mental health issues are anxiety, right? Anxiety leads to stress. Stress leads to depression, leads to alcoholism, leads to eating disorders. Anxiety is the catalyst, right? But also anxiety is the biggest part about mental health. And this is why. Because we go to Google, right? Especially if we're struggling, we're trying to find resources and ways to reach out and people to talk to. And we type in alcoholism, right? Or I'm struggling with alcohol or I'm depressed. And what do you see? 80 million search results. And what's the, what do we know about people with anxiety? If we give them 80 million options, you're not going to make a decision because 80 million is too many. And oftentimes those first 10 million are going to be things that are not applicable to you, not close to you, not even fucking remotely near what you're struggling with. So we're trying to fix that. 
There are millions upon millions upon millions of resources in this world, and we're going to find them. This is this is one of my really exciting things right now. So the podcast is continuing, right? The Open Heart Collective is going to continue until I no longer have a voice and I'm going to hire somebody to do this for me because it's important that we continue these conversations. But we got to take it to the next level. And this is how we're going to do it. So all these resources that exist on planet Earth. So I don't care where you are. You could be in New Delhi, India. You could be in Arizona. You could be in Chicago. You could be in London. I don't care where you are. But what we're going to do, we're going to find all the resources where you are. And then we're going to know where you are. That sounds creepy. But <laughs> point, point being, guys, we're going to find all the resources that are available to you. And we're going to put them in a convenient way so that you can find them and you can use them and you guys can get the help that you need. Because I don't want to see anybody else get lost. That's why this, this conversation is important. That's why we're going to continue it. That's why I've got to talk to a lot. I've got to talk to Colby a lot off air because I have a feeling there's a lot of uh, a lot more work him and I can do. But we're going to take all of this content, all of these resources, all of these tools, and we're going to put it together in an app. And it's going to be the simplest interface you could possibly imagine. You're literally going to fill in the fucking blank. I'm struggling with Based on what you type in and where you are, we're going to be able to guide resources directly to you so that you can make a decision, so that you can get the help that you need, or so that you can get the help for that friend, that person that you know is struggling, but you can't just break, you can't break through. This is how we change the world. This is how we make things better. And I am so... I want to put this up on the screen for a second because this is important. That's the problem. There aren't resources like there should be or enough funding for mental health care. Absolutely. That's why we're going to change that. Because again, it's not up to legislation to fix this. It's up to us to fix this. So what I'm going to ask for from each and every one of you who's listening, each and every guest that has been a part of this show, past, present, and future, I want to know these resources. I can't be everywhere at the same time. I'd love to be. If I can figure out how to be omnipotent, I'm going to. But right now I'm not. So share these resources with me. I don't they could be the smallest little therapy office in the back hole of the littlest city in this country. I want to know what it is. Because we're gonna pull all this data together. And we're going to bring this out to the market in 2019. If this is the last fucking thing I do, this is it. Anyways, guys, Colby, <laughs> I mean, you know, you and I could talk for hours, brother. Dude, I built a, a supplement focused on stress like management. Mm -hmm. it's, cortisol, it's all about cortisol management. Like, we could do a whole episode on the science of stress, dude. I did, I've done probably 200. Yeah podcast on just stress management we'll, 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 just, we'll, 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 we'll do it chemically on like how stress works we'll have to create an ancillary episode of the show for that yeah just do, a, you do an extras and you and i could do a 30 minute conversation with science and stress yeah. i'll send you some links of some whiteboards and some stuff i did awesome i, I do have I believe I have a couple boxes of supplements that i could get to that i'll give away to your audience man i'll just ship them to you and you can ship them out we'll find a way to help mm -hmm. right that's sir colby I, I I know I posted this in the video last night that I shared, but I've got so much fucking respect for you, man. Oh, I have <laughs> looked Thank up you. to you for a, a long time, and this has been an honor. I mean, it's it's always an honor whenever I have people who share their stories on this show. And I mean, the fact that people continue to desire to want to be on this show, it just, just floors me. It's been an incredible journey so far but like i said the work has just started so colby where <laughs> for everybody who's listened who will watch later who's watching now or who will listen later where's the best 
place for people to get in contact with you? What's your what's your number one platform for people to find you? If you go to um, I'm Colby K.com. So I, the letter I am, I'm K O L B Y K A Y. That's my website, but any handle on social media, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. It's all uh, forward slash I am the letters. I am Colby K O L B Y K A Y. Yes. Your website's broken. I know. I just broke it like this last week. It's <laughs> fuck. Just give, go to Facebook. You go to Facebook and look at, at, at I'm a Colby K. That's where most of my conversations are and happening. I, I'm going to put, I'm going to make sure yeah, yeah, yeah. include your links and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Facebook and Instagram are the places to find me. Right. Um, Colby, as always, my man, such an honor. Tomorrow, we will be back with another episode. We were supposed to do Tuesday, Friday, but now it's been Thursday, Friday. Um, so we'll be back right here, six o'clock Central Standard Time tomorrow. I hope you guys can tune in because this one, is, I haven't known him very long, but this guy, this guy is m literally climbing the seven summits of the world and helping kids in these countries everywhere along the way. I cannot wait to have Mark Guido on the show tomorrow, an absolute beast of a human being. And um, stay tuned for more. We've got a lot coming your way. But in the meantime, I like to end um, on this little mantra that, that, I, uh, that I do. And I hope you guys can find value in it. But it is as follows. Be happy, number one. Have fun, number two. Hustle your fucking ass off, number three. But remember, guys, there is no amount of hustle on this planet that brings happiness or fun. So you got to have those two first. Make sure you take time to breathe as well because that's important too. But see you guys tomorrow. Colby, I'll have you stick around for a second. Any what, what words of wisdom before we uh, before we let the people go? Be good to yourself. Be good to other people, and call your mom. Call your mom today or tomorrow. I'm just legit like, gonna like call my mom and call my it. dad and my grandma as soon as we get off the phone. <laughs> just tell them you love them. That's it. No other reason. Just tell me you love them. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. Later.